I want to. I want to. I want to follow up on question one, which was was uh, not question one, but uh, yes, question one on the, the uh, my original question. Um, we've talked about the, the the will of the voters. Let's talk about the will of the legislators. Um, th they didn't have the will to um, reverse Prop Two and a Half. Um, they are at risk of losing the next election if they put their thumb in the voter's face. So uh, there is a, regardless of, of your, your feeling, Dan, that this is a message, there, there is a possibility that this could stick if, if that were true. I mean, you're for it on the basis that it's a message. Are you, are you for it on the basis that um, it's reality? Well, let's, let's, let's be very clear about my position on question one. This is the one issue I danced on a little bit in the early debates. And the reason I did it was because I'm running to deal with our current fiscal reality. I didn't want my candidacy to be about question one, pushing it, opposing it, either way. I, I view it. Quite honestly, as I've said, I view it as a message vote, and I don't. Th I think it is detached from the reality that we're facing right now. Um, when you um, w w when you say they didn't stop Proposition Two and a Half, you're right, they didn't. That was back in a healthier time where the legislature actually responded to the will of the voters. Since then, they've gotten in a different habit, and since then, the supermajority has gotten much stronger to the point where they can do almost anything they want to do. Very literally, when you say they're at risk. Um, I love the, uh, the anecdote of the budget process this year when they literally voted to say, we're going to debate behind closed doors, asked by a reporter, by a reporter. How do you justify that? The chair of the House Rules Committee said, well, the members like to do it that way. That's the climate we live in, where a politician can say something like that to a reporter, and he has no fear of retribution from the voters. Maybe we're turning. I hope we are. I hope the embarrassment of Dan, question one passing on the one will turn right? us. but. I don't think we're there, Jim. I absolutely do not think right, we're enough. there. But I'm going to please ask again that we stay on the one minute. You, you got a signal. Let's stay on it. Carolyn, your response to Jim. I'm not even sure what the question was. Okay, let's you go back. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? It was more of a question for Dan. Okay. Uh, I right. think we know it was, it was kind of following up on the whole message idea versus the reality idea. Um, I think we know where Carolyn stands. So I'm... Can, I'm, I, can I make a comment on that sure. anyway? But you can. And, and again, this... this speaks to the fundamental difference between what I think I have been talking about and what Dan has been talking about, which is right now, times are so tough for people paying their bills. We cannot be cavalier about sending a message to the State House. These are very serious issues that impact very real lives every day, and we need to be looking for solutions that can provide relief to them, not just talking in sound bites. And, and talking about sending messages to the state house, it's it's we're beyond that. We need to work together and really make things happen. All right, okay. Michelle. I, I have one follow up to continue this further. Okay. I do, um, and and it relates to sending a message. My question is, do you believe that the people that are in favor of question and one and are going to go out and actually vote for it, do they think they're sending a message, or do they think they're going to get a rebate check? Are you asking me? Yeah. I, I, have, I have a 30 second answer to this. I one. have no idea. And, and frankly, that's why I answered this question very specifically when it was first posed. Um, actually, as Jim, it was our editorial board when you first really put it to me. But I answered the question as what I am going to do as a voter on this issue. And that's why I'm not out pounding the pavement and saying vote yes on question one. People have their own reasons. I think a good deal of it is people are fed up. And whether they think they're sending a message or they're actually thinking that they're going to change things doesn't particularly matter to me. I think they're fed up, and that's what's driving this. And they're fed up for very real reasons. Alan, your view on whether or not they're voting in reality or sending a message? My sense is, um, and I have talked to a lot of people about this issue, is that they are sending a message. They're very frustrated. They're very anxious. They need help, and they need leadership. They need to see a plan for how we are going to move beyond where we are now. They want legislators, 
you know, from the top on down, from the federal level on down, to stop talking and start doing. And that's why I believe so strongly that right now, if ever, we need a full-time representative who has worked in our communities, who understands what our community's needs are, and be able to represent that voice at the State House. All right, Michelle, now you can ask a question. Okay. All right, now we're going to go back to the uh, topic that was touched on briefly, which is education. Uh, you have both made strong statements in favor of adequate funding for education, um, but there appear to be some differences um, how that's funded. And we could look as an example to the, the Holliston override, which I believe Carolyn, you were in favor of and Dan, you were not. Mm -hmm. um, so it comes down to where is the funding for education going to come from? You know, we asked where is it going to come from for transportation? It's the same thing. Where is it going to come from for education? Carolyn, you have the first minute on this one. Sure. I mean, I, f I think the first step is not to lose revenues. We absolutely need every revenue stream that we have right now. Again, back to question one, we need to, to vote that down. I think back to the point I made earlier about working smarter at all levels of government. You know, we can work smarter at the local level by group purchasing, by regionalization, which is something that I've talked about before. So every dollar that we save in, in pooling certain resources can be put into education. Um, and I think right now, I think that's what we need to focus on. Focus on being efficient and, and saving money, putting it into priorities, research, education and infrastructure. Dan, same question. Sure. And Michelle, we went around on this uh, the first time we yeah. were in this room with Carolyn. I reject your premise, which is that we need to find new funding to uh, put into local aid to fund education. On the Hill, uh, the most overused word is priorities. Everything is a priority. And Carolyn's already picking up the vernacular. Everybody says that their spending item is a priority. And so when everything's a priority, Functionally, nothing's a priority. Public education ought to be a priority of state government, and it ought to be funded adequately before we run off to the caucus chamber and add $220 million of earmarks for little pet projects that nobody in the public gets to see who put them in or why. I've been in the State House, and Carolyn talks a lot about her local experience, and that's very valuable. We're not running for selectmen. I was the governor's deputy legal counsel. My job was to review every piece of legislation passed by the legislature. I know how our legislature works, how it doesn't work, how it interacts with cities and towns, and how it should be fixed. OK. Jim. All righty, then. We are, I get, uh, just I, so people know, we're, we're about eight and a half minutes left in our broadcast. I'd here. like to comment on that. That helps. Uh, you have a 30 yes. second. And if you so desire afterwards, you have sure. to say right. um, well. Priorities are an issue. And I am the only candidate of the three of us who are originally running who has offered a tangible way to move beyond just talking about priorities and actually prioritizing competing um, requirements at the state level. And what I have said is I, I recommend a fiscal impact statement that accompany every um, bill that goes through the legislature so we can make educated, informed decisions about priorities, about where to generate revenues and where we should spend our limited dollars. Last time I met with, with Dan, he commented that, well, that in fact, he, he basically negated the, the idea by saying, well, that's been in existence for a number of years and it's just ignored. Dan, we need to get beyond the finger pointing and the blame and actually you know, let's, let's start implementing it then and, and make some progress. Dan, your rebuttal. Well, again, I've been there. And if Carolyn thinks that as a freshman member of the supermajority, uh, she can go to the State House and force the Speaker to put a uh, fiscal impact statement on legislation, which has been required since 1970 by rule, God bless her. That's not the way things work. Um, I, you know, <laughs> when you, when you, when you say uh, time after time, um, fiscal impact statement, fiscal impact statement, I'm going to go work with people. You're talking about an understanding of state government that doesn't exist right now. And it doesn't exist specifically because there are 141 members in the House who are a member of the same party. And the supermajority doesn't follow its own rules. It does everything behind closed doors. The only way to fix that is to get some balance in government. I represent that, and my opponent does not. 